Evet. Yavaş yavaş başlayabiliriz. Öncelikle hepiniz hoş geldiniz. E, canlı yayın için mikrofon kullanarak ilerleyeceğiz. Aslında e, sesimiz belki yetişiyor ama e, bugün daha önceden de aslında devam ettiğimiz Power BI ile ilgili webinar serileri vardı. Bu webinar serisini birazcık daha üst aşamaya taşımaya çalışıyorduk bir zamandır. E, bugün aramızda iki tane e, son derece e, bu konuda uzman, Power BI konusunda uzman e, iki tane Microsoft'un MVP'si var. Ee, belki MVP ne demek diye aklınıza gelebilir. MVP Microsoft'un partnerler arasından, Microsoft'un e, ürünleri üzerinde geliştirme yapan developerlar arasından e, seçtiği Most Valuable Professional şeklinde açılımı olan aslında değerli partnerler. E, Reza ve Leyla da Yeni Zelanda'da e, hem partnerleri olan yani partner olarak çalıştıkları tabii ki bütün dünyada farklı şirketlerle bir arada çalışıyorlar. E, aynı zamanda da community açısından, Power BI'nin community, Power Platform'un community açısından çok güzel işler yapıyorlar. E, sağ olsunlar İstanbul'a geldiklerini bana söylediklerinde ben de böyle bir etkinlik, e, biz de böyle bir etkinlik yapabiliriz diye konuştuk. E, bugün e, kendileri bize iki güzel session'da Power BI ile ilgili e, önemli bilgiler verecekler. E, tabii ki session'ın dili İngilizce olacak onların kısımlarında e, ama soru cevap kısımlarında istediğiniz dilde soru sorup e, kendileriyle ya da bizim aracılığımızla e, görüşmeyi ilerletebiliriz. E, çok kısa başlarken bahsetmedim ama kendimden bahsedeyim tanışmadıklarımız için. Benim ismim Mustafa. E, Microsoft Türkiye'de yaklaşık 5 yıldır çalışıyorum ve iş zekası raporlama e, Microsoft'un Power Platform ismini verdiği platformdan sorumluyum. E, yanımda da Hasret var. Hasret belki sen de çok kısa kendinden bahsedersin. Merhabalar, hoş geldiniz hepiniz öncelikle. İsmim Hasret. Ben de Microsoft'ta Technical Specialist olarak çalışıyorum. Daha çok Dynamics ile ilgili, Dynamics ile alakalı işler, çalışmalar yapıyorum aslında. O yüzden Power Platform'a da çok kesişen bir alan olduğu için ben de bugün sizlerle olmak, Dynamics tarafından gelebilecek sorular için aranızda bulunmak istedim. Hepinize hoş geldiniz. Peki o zaman çok uzatmadan sözü ben önce Reza'ya vermek istiyorum. Let's start with Reza. Can you hear me? One, two, three. Yes, no. One, two, three. I can be louder. One, two, three. One, two, three. Uh, a little bit up. Okay, I'll try to do that. One, two, three. Yes, no. Can you hear me? No, not that much. Okay. Uh, you can. You can hear me. Yeah. Uh, at the back, can you hear me? This is this is how I usually are is talk. So can you hear me now? Yes. This is a good tone. Okay. So we'll work with that. Um, hey. Um. Okay. Is this connected there as well? Okay. Okay. Um. Good. Uh. Evening. Good evening. What do you say? Good evening in Turkish. Yakshama. Yakshama. Uh, <laughs> thank you for coming to this session. Um, uh, uh, my time is 45 minutes, so I'll try my best to stick into that 45 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> and sorry about uh, doing this in English. I don't know. Turkish, unfortunately. Uh, this session is about Power BI modeling, some basic tips of Power BI modeling, which is helpful for you to build a proper model uh, and get some analysis out of your model. So it's not advanced uh, stuff that I'm going to talk about, some basic stuff, but still very useful. Uh, before I talk about that, a little bit about myself. I'm Reza Rad. I'm a, a Microsoft Regional Director, uh, but I'm not working for Microsoft. Our Microsoft is not very, so it doesn't work for Microsoft. I don't know myself as well. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP as well. Um, I'm a consultant and trainer on Power BI. Um, and Leila will speak later on as well. She's uh, or AI uh, professional. Um, I have written some uh, books on Power BI. Some of them are free already if you go to our website. How many of you heard of Radicat website? 
Okay, very few. Um, uh, we write articles in English, unfortunately, uh, articles uh, and videos for uh, Power BI and AI. Um, we have a book, uh, 1,200 pages. Feel free to download it uh, and feel free to print it if you have that much uh, printer. Uh, my contact information is also in the slides. I'll send it to Mustafa. He would share it somehow with you later on. Uh, we are based in New Zealand. The other side of the world, if you consider this is the world, if you pin, if you put a pin from here, it comes out from New Zealand, right? Okay, so let's uh, start talking about uh, my session. Uh, so first, uh, I will explain what is a dimension table because we are talking about power BI modeling. What is a dimension table? Uh, what are features of a dimension table? Uh, a very quick overview of that. Some of you might already heard of dimension table, fact table. We will talk about those. What is a star schema? how to build a star schema. Then I'll show you a, a demo of a model which is not performing well uh, and with changing it to a star schema, we, we change it in a way that it performs well, right? Now, how many of you are coming from um, database background? Database developers, DBAs. How many of you are coming from Excel background? Excel, Excel, we should have more than. Okay, um, so half, half. Uh, which is still good. Um, um, so let's talk about some of the modeling basics in Power BI. Uh, one of the things that I hear in Power BI is that uh, when I ask people when they do the modeling in Power BI is that, okay, uh, when you build the model, when you create the relationship, this is how you do that, this is how you do that. And then a lot of people come and say, okay, I have only one table. I don't need to know about relationships. I don't need to, to know about what is bi-directional relationship, what is single directional relationship, and all those sort of things. But the fact is that you always have more than one relationship. I will show you one example of that. Because as soon as you start extending your model, you get one more table, another table. And if you start combining all in one table, you end up with one big hassle, right? Uh, so I'm showing you a, a, an example of a data model that has uh, multiple tables. With that multiple tables, you, you have a different diagram, different view of the tables and how to manage it. Now, first, let's talk about uh, these tables. Uh, the first table that you need to know in a Power BI model um, or any BI model is a dimension table. Dimension table is um, a type of a table that has descriptive information in it. Descriptive information is something that describes something. Let's say uh, product name product brand, product color, product, um, let's say, size, or if you consider customer, customer name, customer address, customer job title, customer uh, location, customer birth date, customer age, all of these are describing customer, right? These are descriptive fields. When I say descriptive field, it doesn't mean text, because age is not text, right? But still, it's describing an attribute of a customer. Uh, birth date of a customer is not a uh, text, it's a, it's a date, right? But still it's describing something of a customer, right? So dimension tables are tables that are describing something. These are tables that in a Power BI model usually are slicers, filters, axis of your chart, right? But not the values. Um, and these are examples of dimension tables, product table, customer table, um, let's say uh, stores, warehouse, depends on all different scenarios, you might have different dimensions. Dimension tables usually are not that much deep. You don't have a dimension table with, let's say, 3 million rows. Usually you don't have that. Dimension tables are like thousands of rows, smaller in terms of rows, but they have a lot of columns. Like a product dimension might have 100 columns but they are not that much deep in terms of number of rows. Number of rows are limited, number of columns, usually quite wide columns. Right? Uh, another type of tables in a Power BI model are fact tables. Fact tables are explaining happening of an action. In a sales scenario, when a sales transaction has been made, there's a record added to a table. That record shows that a sales transaction has been made. This customer, at this date, uh, came and purchased this product. Right? An action happened. Right? Uh, these are fact tables. Fact tables usually store numbers, 
numbers that are important for our analysis, like for example, how much was the sales value, the dollar value, right? Um, how many of these items have been sold? And these, item, these numbers usually are numbers that are additive, you can add them together, like you have aggregated value. Let's say you have sales amount for the entire year sometime. Sometimes you have sales amount for one single customer, sales amount for a week, sales amount for a month. You can get the aggregated value, right? So numeric and aggregate table values are in the fact table. Examples, order quantity, unit price, sales amount, all of these are uh, numeric and aggregate table values, right? Uh, in the fact table, you have uh, a number of these numeric columns, we call them facts. And you also have some columns that are your key to the dimension table, because somehow this should still connect to the dimension table, right? When you say this customer at this date purchased something, this should have a key to the customer table, a key to the date table, a key to the product table, and all others are facts, right? Sales amount, quantity, and things like that. Now, depends on how much information you store in your fact table, there are uh, there is something called grain of the fact table. Grain of the fact table is saying that how much details you store in your fact table. For example, sometimes for your analysis, monthly data is enough, like budget. Budget data is per month, let's say, per product category, per department. Right. Grain of the budget fact table is product category, month, and uh, um, department, right? But grain of your sales table might be per day, per product, per, per store, per customer, and a lot of other things, right? That is also another important factor in the fact table, right? So grain of tables define how, uh, how much details you store in a table, right? Now, how fact table and dimensions are connected to each other Usually you have many to one relationship from the fact table to all dimensions. The fact table is the one that you see in the center. Dimensions are those around. Every dimension has one to many relationship, or if you consider some facts, it's like many to one from the fact table to the dimensions. This is building something that in uh, data warehousing terminology, we call it star schema. Uh, fact table is the heart of your star and all dimensions around. With one single relationship from the fact table, you get to a dimension table. Right? This is the perfect design of a data model, regardless of Power BI or any other BI tools you use in the market. You have to follow these principles to get the best data model. Right? So this is how the star schema works. And you can have one fact table with one dimension. You can have one fact table with 10 dimensions, right? The number of dimensions doesn't matter. It, it's not like five, five point a star, it's, it, as many as points you have, right? Something that you should avoid in this design is a snowflake. A snowflake means that you have fact table connected to a dimension, dimension connected to another dimension. Uh, what is the example? Uh, let's say I have sales, uh, fact sales. This is connected to product table. Product table connected to product category table, right? This is an extra relationship. This will slow down your model. This will cause one extra relationship, one more filtering to go through, right? You should avoid that. Combine those tables together, one product table. Or fact table to customer table, customer table to the location of the customer, right? That is, again, extra. You have to combine them together, one customer table, having all of those, right? So you should... Uh, Prepare your model to have something like this. One single relationship between fact table and dimension, right? And uh, when I talk about the star schema, a lot of time people saying that, okay, I have two fact tables, so that means I don't have a star schema. No. Even with two fact tables, you can still have a star schema. From every fact table, you should have like one star model. This fact table, another star model. And they can share some of the dimensions. Fine. That's absolutely fine. This is a still a star schema and it still works perfectly fine. Right. Having two, three, four, five, ten fact tables doesn't mean that you don't have a star schema anymore, right? It is a still a star schema. And I'm going to show you one example of that, right? 
the star schema is something that I would say is like a music conductor in a orchestra. Without the star schema, your Power BI model probably would work. You create somehow the relationship, you put both directional relationship, this, this, that, that, that. They would somehow work, right? You get it working somehow. Without uh, music, without orchestra music conductor, when you go to orchestra, you will still hear something. It's not the best music that you would hear, right? But you still hear something. Uh, they are not uh, synchronized with each other. A star schema is like that music conductor. It will make that harmony synchronized. It will make everything to work with each other, right? Okay, so enough of talking. Let me show you a demo of, um, of the scenario I'm talking about. So this is Power BI. Okay, Power BI desktop. I'm connect, uh, I actually have a table already here. This is my sales label. Let me enable zooming. Uh, this is my sales table, one single table. Right, really simple. One single table with these records in it: product, date, quantity, and revenue. Right, and I can easily use this table in any visualizations. I can create a table visual here with all of these information in it. Right. Uh, then I can put a filter for date, another filter, or let's say a slicer for product. And it works perfectly fine for uh, analysis, right? It's not a really nice visualization. You probably create better visualization than this, but still, it's a report, it's an analysis on the sales table, right? Now, uh, when I show this to my, let's say, user, they come and say, okay, this is great. You got the analysis of the sales. Now I want also to add inventory analysis, to this, right? Or manufacturing analysis into the same thing. So what I'll do is I'll connect to that data source that has already these. And this time I select manufacturing, which is something like that. It also has the date and product and the cost of creating every product. Uh, and inventory, which has the date, product, warehouse of every product and the quantity of those. Right. I'll bring these into Power BI. If you worked with Power BI already, you know that in Power BI, uh, when you load tables, Power BI automatically creates relationships. That's one of the things default by default happens. It automatically creates a relationship between tables, which unfortunately here it did not happen. Can you tell me why it's not happening? Why I don't have relationships? Because of names. Because of names? Some of these names are the same, like like this. You see product here, product there. Probably the data types. Data types are also the same. So uh, if I look at, for example, product, uh, let's say product is text, I think, and product here is also text. There's just single type fact table. There is no single fact table. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, the product codes are repeating in manufacturing and I have repeated values of the product, right? So let's say there is no single, um, single unique list of products, right? That's also one of the things that will be checked. When, when Power BI wants to create relationship, it checks a few things. One, field name, then data type, those things that you mentioned then do we have a table with unique values of that field? It should be unique, like there should be, one of these tables should be like having one uh, product per row, right? But I don't have that, I can still create a relationship, something like this, right? I can connect product from here to product from there, but it would come as a many-to-many -many relationship. Many-to-many -many relationship cause a lot of uh, problems because uh, because it slow down your model. It needs like a table in the middle. It creates a table, intermediate table somewhere in the memory behind the scene that also calls that. And many to many relationship always comes with both directional relationship. If you have worked with Power BI um, for some time, you know that both directional relationship means that filtering in both directions. 
And when that happens, that will slow down your model even, even more than that, right? So both directional relationships, many to many, combination of these will significantly slow down your model, right? But let's say we did that, right? Let's say I did that both directional relationship and created one, right? And it is many to many as well. Now, uh, I also want to connect these based on the date field. Can I do that? Let's say, let's say I do that. Let's say I connect based on the date field. Now, the second connection is still the same thing. Many to many, I don't have a single list of date tables. And the second relationship will become inactive relationship. You cannot have more than one single relationship between two tables, right? The second one would become inactive. And inactive relationship doesn't actually do anything, right? It's like a relationship that you can use in DAX using a specific function called use relationship. Without that, this doesn't really do anything, right? And that's only between two tables. What if I want also to bring another table, the third table in this story, right? You see this starts messing up, right? It's not a really good model. And the main reason for that is that we don't have a table with unique list of items. We don't have a dimension table. We don't have a descriptive table for products. We don't have a descriptive table for date. Those are our dimension tables. These three tables that you are looking at, these are like fact tables. They are talking about happening of something, inventory. It's talking about an inventory item stored in a warehouse. Sales is talking about the sales transaction has been made. Manufacturing, a product has been manufactured at this day, right? These are talking about the action happened. There is no descriptive table here, so I cannot really connect these uh, three in a really good way. So let me do that differently. So what I'll do is instead of doing these inactive relationships and also many to many relationships, what I'll do is I'll go and create that, uh, create those tables, dimension tables, right? And I'll start by creating the product table. Um, there are different places you can do that. You can use SQL Server if you are more comfortable with that, writing to SQL code, you can do that in DAX, or you can do that in Power Query. I'm going to show you that in Power Query because that's something you can use everywhere. Um, so I'll go to Edit Queries. These are my three tables, right? I'm going to create uh, a concatenate, uh, let's say a consolidated list of products. You see, I have some products here, some products here, and some products here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to create a copy of each of these tables, remove all other columns, only keep the product column, then combine them all together. Right. Uh, when I'm going to create a copy of this table, what is the best way of creating a copy? Stop. Copy? Stop. Maybe? Stop. Duplicate? Have you ever used this one? Reference? What is the difference? Uh, when I create a duplicate of a query, it's like a copy and paste. Right. This query, now I create another copy of that. These two copies are totally separate from each other. If I go and change that one, this one will not change. If I go and change this one, that one will not change. Right? Is that what we want? No. Because we want the original one to be like the single source of truth. Right? So I use reference, that means it is still a copy, right? But it's always looking at this first way. If I go and change something in there, this will have that change, and I can add more steps onto that, right? So I'm going to do reference, right? As you see, it's a copy, uh, but it's still looking at that. And I'm creating a reference of every one of these queries. Right, so three references. Now, in each reference, I'm going to remove all columns except product. Right, so, remove other columns. That keeps only product here. And in this one, remove other columns. If you haven't used Power Query, this is how easy it is to use for doing data transformation. Remove other columns. So, I have three tables with product only. Right. Now, I'm going to combine these in one table. How can I combine them in one table? Append. 
Not merge. Because, uh, because you do the merge usually when you want to bring more columns, create a flattened structure, right? In this case, we don't want to do that. We just want to append these rows. Same structure, we are just going to add rows under each other, right? So we use append. Now, one important thing about append is that when you are appending tables, they should have exactly the same structure. These two, inventory, I have a column called product. Manufacturing, I have a column called product. How about sales? Product name, right? So we have to rename this to call it product. Right, now they are all exactly the same. I'm going to home tab, append queries, append queries as new. Let's say I want to keep those uh, separate queries as it is. Append queries as new. And then I choose three or more tables. Sales is already there, select manufacturing and inventory, right? I'm appending these three. And here is the append result. So append is like adding rows after each other. In SQL Server, what is the equivalent of this? Union. Union. And if you have worked with SQL Server, there are two types of union. Union, all union. What is their difference? One of them removes the duplicate. The other one keeps the duplicate. Do you think this keeps the duplicate or removes? It keeps the duplicate, right? So it's like union all in SQL Server. And now, after creating that, I'm going to remove duplicates. So let's do that. Remove rows, remove duplicates, right? Power Query is easy. If you haven't used Power Query, it's a good time to go and use it, right? And I'm going to call this product table. Now, this is my product table, right? Now, what should I do with these three tables? Can I delete them? I cannot delete them because as soon as I click on delete, it tells me that you have used it other places. If I don't delete them, what happens? When I say close and load, what happens? In Power BI, I will have like, it will create extra relationships, it will create extra tables. Extra tables means extra memory consumption. Power BI is in memory technology. Less memory consumption, usually better performance, right? So I have to do this. I have to say right click on these, uncheck enable load. That means these tables are not going to be loaded into Power BI. They are still part of my refresh process. You might think uh, if I enable, if I disable that, they will not stop. Uh, they will stop refreshing. No, they are still part of the refresh process. Data comes through the into the final product table every time we do. Right. But those tables individually won't be loaded. So after doing this, I have my product table and everything is easy to use. I'll create the date table separately in another way. So let's first use the product table. Close and apply. Now the new product table will come and as you see, Power BI automatically understand the relationship between these. Let me move these slightly around so you can see that, right? So I have one product table now connected all of these three. We call it shared dimension, a dimension that is shared between fact tables. These are three fact tables, right? Now, this is a product table. What about date table? You need to also have a date table. Uh, there are different ways in Power BI you can create a date table. So you see that I have date field in each of these and I want to create the connection based on that. There are different ways to create a date table. Uh, one is in Power Query. That's usually my favorite option because it gives you a lot of uh, possibilities. You can even connect to a website, fetch public holidays. Let's say you want to do an analysis and you want to get, let's say, public holidays of um, your state, your country, also in your date dimension. Do something with that. Power Query is really good on that, right? Uh, but it will take time if I explain how to do that in Power Query, right? So I'm uh, doing the uh, simpler approach, which is doing that in DAX. In DAX, I can create a date table just like this. Uh, so I'll go to data tab, modeling tab. I create a new table. This is a table generated in memory, right? A new table generated in memory. Now let's call this date table. 
Uh, there's, a, there's a really good function in DAX called calendar uh, that you can specify from this start date to this end date go and create a date table for you, right? And it will give you the list of dates. Uh, however, if you are going to do that, then usually you have to go and see what is the minimum date in, in all of your tables. And then what is the maximum date in all of your tables? And then say minimum is the start, maximum is the end, right? So instead of doing that, we have another function called calendar auto, right? And calendar auto is doing exactly what I told you. It will look at all tables in your data model, all columns, find the minimum date across all of those. And again, across all of these, find the maximum date and create a date table from the minimum to the max, right? It will consider full dates, right? Uh, if you have fiscal uh, year configuration, you can go and set that up, but I don't have it, so I just close the brackets, and that's it. So it's just a function calendar also. And this is how it creates that, right? Uh, this is a date table, that means it will have one single day, one single row per day. Even if I don't have a sales in that day, I will still have it. So this is my date table. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is going to the model tab. This table should come somewhere here. Yep, it is there. Now let me move these a little bit around. So I'm putting dimensions around. I'm putting facts in the middle. And I'm connecting these to their fact table. And it would be one too many relationships from the from each dimension to the fact table. So uh, let's have a closer look at every relationship. That's dimension table connected to the fact table, one to many relationships. Dimension table connected to the fact table, one to many relationships. Same story, one to many relationships. These are my fact tables, and they are also connected to another dimension. If you consider this as your data model, you see that we already have a star schema. Let's say this is a star, it's like a two-point star. And this is also another star, and this is also another star, right? Your star should not be just like five points, right? And some of these, let's say later on, this fact table might have a dimension that is not related to other fact tables, which is absolutely fine. This might have its own dimension again, right? So it's still building the star schema. Everything is based on the best practice, right? What is the good thing about this scenario? This scenario is giving me full analysis power. I can go to the report. I can remove these. Let's say I make this a slightly smaller. I create a table visual for inventory, date, product, quantity, warehouse, let's say. Another table for Manufacturing, date, product, cost, right? So these are my three tables, right? Not a course about visualization, so I won't talk about how to make it nicer and things like that. We'll just keep it that way. Then I put a filter here for date. Now, which of these dates should I use for my date table? Dimension. The one under dimension, right? But having these other dates will make it a little bit like confusing. So one of the other things you should do in your model after doing this configuration is to go and hide those fields or your relationship fields in the fact table. There is an easy way to hide them all together. Just search for them here. You can go and select them at the same time and then set that is hidden. Right? This is added recently in the last, I think, six, seven months. Previously, you had to go to every one of those, hide, hide, or you had to use some like shortcut keys in keyboard, shift F10, right click, do something like that, right? Okay, so that's that, and same thing for product. So, product, I just keep the dimension and I hide all other three. So as you see, these are hidden. I only see the facts in each table. 
right? Going back to my reporting view, now when I look at date, there is only one place with date. So I'll bring that into my data slicer. And this data slicer can filter everything. Right? As you can see, this is affecting all of these three things. I can also add another slicer for product. I'm not that much space in my report, so I'm just adding this over here. So one more for product. <coughs> and this is also filtering them all. Right. So using shared dimension approach, you get the uh, you get the option that you can actually have uh, one, two, three dimensions filtering all fact tables. Right. Uh, to fit this in one place, I'll probably do this as well. Let's say we make simple. By the way, if you haven't used this option, it's really great. So then I can select it, and you can see how it is. Okay, so that was uh, how we used the star schema to build a model, which is. Do you this? Which is star schema. We are using shared dimensions. That means when you slice and dice based on those dimensions, it will filter all the facts in your data model, regardless of their grain, regardless of where they are. Uh, you have master lists, which are your dimensions. We use Power Query to do that. So regardless of the data source, you can still use this approach as long as you are not using direct query or live connection or things like that. In those cases, you handle that in the data source. Uh, and you always have single directional relationship. You don't have uh, both directional relationship to reduce the performance. So this is performing really well, right? Uh, there was another example, uh, which if I explained that, that would be like an, another hour to explain, right? I would skip that. But uh, I just explained that a little bit. Sometimes uh, you have tables with different granularity. One fact table is the budget fact table. It's at the month level. The other fact table is the sales transaction fact table. That's at the day level, right? When you connect those together, what would you do? Do you create like a date dimension and a month dimension? What do you think is the best approach? Because if you create a date dimension and a month dimension, what happens is that then later on you use your date dimension in a slicer that would only filter this table, right? It will not filter the other table because that's connected to the month dimension, right? You should still follow the shared dimension approach. You need one dimension. But if you use date dimension, then the problem is that that data is not in a day level, that's on a monthly level. There's a very common way to do that, and that way is saying that uh, you have the monthly data, right? So you go and create like the uh, like a value first day of every month, right? First of July, first of June, first first of every month, right? And using that, you can connect to this thing. Right? Then you have one table filtering both. right? But you have to be aware that as long as you are at the month level, it gives you meaningful data, right? It will filter both. But as soon as you go to the day level in your slicing and dicing, uh, one of the tables makes sense because that's on a day level anyway. But this table won't make sense because you select, for example, 28th of a month, there is no budget because the budget value is connected for the first of that month, right? You have to then put some calculations, tax calculations to combine it and to make it easier. Like, for example, when someone selected 28th of the month, it will go and pick the first of the month value, show it that, show it there, right? I have written uh, a blog article about that, which is already in our website, so you can go and read it. Uh, I have some, uh, oops, sorry, I have some links uh, about every single example that I showed you. There is an article, so I'll send it to uh, Mustafa, he would share it with you. Uh, we have something like uh, seven minutes, if there is any question. Yes? You use the direction, the relationships, one direction. Why don't you use both directions? So when we, when we create both directional filter, 
Both direction of filter means that filter these two tables constantly uh, by each other, right? Part of your processor uh, calculation engine is always used for filtering these two tables, right? Now, imagine in your real model, you don't have two tables, right? You have like 20 tables. Right? And if any of those both directional relationships takes a little bit of space, right? Part of, a big part of your processing is always constantly using, right? It's like your brain, half of your brain is always used for something, right? It doesn't really have the capacity to analyze something else, right? That's one problem. Another problem is that uh, if you do both directional relationships, sometimes it creates circular reference scenario, and it doesn't really give you the option to do that all the time. Sometimes it says you already have that, to that, that, to that, that, to that, so this is not possible, we make it inactive. So problems like that. That's why it is good to avoid. Okay, good. Okay, I think we are good to do the break. Okay, like a 15 minutes? Yes, uh, we, we will have 15 minutes break. Have us a couple of minutes in cigarette, start in it, cigarette channel. On the stick of honor, I'll change it. They like that much. Oh, 
Tekrar merhabalar. E, i̇kinci seçinimizde de Leyla bizimle olacak. E, Leyla da e, aynı zamanda MVP, Microsoft e, Most Valuable e, Professional. And I think she will also introduce herself. Thank you Leyla for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Leyla. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome again. I'm Leyla. I work with Reza in Vajakad. And I'm AI and data platform MVP and based in Auckland, New Zealand, far from here, the land of Hobbiton. And actually, we cover a lot uh, the different conferences. And uh, if you want interested to learn more about Power BI and AI, it's the website that we have. We do lots of blog posts. And also, there are some free books that two of them is here, one of them about using R inside Power BI and other about Azure Machine Learning. So this free book is available in the website. There is another book with the publisher of the APRS that actually you can purchase it from uh, Amazon website. But the, the other two is free and you can download it alongside with the result book that we want to see what it does. So what I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about the new easy AI that we have in data flow. So what is data flow and what sort of AI we have? I'm going to just have a look on these possibilities together. Uh, before I'm going ahead, I just showed the picture 
that I'm missing. He said, my son, but he's actually tried to say what we have in Microsoft Excel. We have pre-built AI and we have custom AI. So pre-built AI in Microsoft is about tools that you don't need to write any code, like cognitive code, like both box frameworks. Maybe some of you heard about these tools. This tool doesn't need any coding and they're easily embedded in other applications. So we call them as a pre-built AI. Also, we have custom AI. This is about the tools that you need to know at least some about the machine learning process and the other, like Azure Machine Learning Study. We want to work with Azure Machine Learning Study. We want Azure Machine R or Python. So we we want worksheet R in Python. So it actually actually helps you to embed your own R and Python inside SQL Server, Power BI, and So you see from business user, from people who don't know anything about AI, to people who know about AI, who know the code, they can build AI. And these courses start from 2014. All of these embedded. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm just going to talk about the one part of that that is in power BI. <coughs> this is actually the uh, revolution of bringing AI in power BI. This is starting in 2015 by creating the R visual inside power BI. That means that you can see it, you can extend your visualization capability by embedding R code. In the next step, you're able to do R in power query. That's Actually, as I mentioned, it's a good tool for data wrangling. You can also do machine learning inside there. You can copy paste your code there. It's actually Python available. And now, in 2019, we have lots of possibility for doing AI without writing the code in data flow. That actually is a power query in Power BI series, Power Query Online. Okay, so let's just start to see how it works. I'm going to the my Power BI desktop, my sorry, my Power BI service. So as you let me enable the zooming so I can zoom and you can see. Okay, sure. <laughs> Sorry. Have you seen this one? So I just start. I, okay. I hope that you don't. <laughs> so we start from here. Yeah. So this is Power BI series. In Power BI series, in the premium plan, so if you go to the workspace, you see that we have a diamond side beside my workspace. That is premium capacity. So you have pro license, you have premium capacity. This AI feature that I'm going to talk about is available in premium capacity. And it's not available in your my workspace. So it's not available in my workspace. You need to create a new workspace here. I'm going to click on the one that I've already created. You have an option named data flow. Data flow, as I mentioned, is like or query in Power BI service. You can get data from different resources. You can uh, transfer the data and also apply to see this. So I'm going to get the data. I have a data uh, about hotel review that already I put it into the blob storage. It is available. I can share it with you also. And I'm going to the data flow. Create. I'm going to connect to the data source that I have. And it's called second. So it's count. 
And here I'm able to add the entity, so add entity. And you will see that I have different type of the connector here. So all of them is there, uh, actually in the cloud, you see I'm able to connect to SharePoint, to the Azure Central, and to different online systems. I'm going to connect to a CSV file that is in my blog story. So I'm click on text and CSV. I put the link here. I'm going to the next step. It's going to import my data from blob storage to my Power BI service. So after that, I can see an environment like Power Query is not as much as advanced as Power Query, but so similar to Power Query. So for people that actually work with that, they can see we can actually do the data transformation, add column, and other things. What I'm going to do, I'm not going to do any data transformation. I'm going to use a new feature that is combination of the cognitive service and data flow. So the name is AI inside. You see the brain sign here. <coughs> Make it. Huh? I'm going to use this one to do the AI capabilities. I'm click on that. And it's going to bring me, connect me to the cognitive services. So, for example, I want to do a score statement, or I want to extract the language of the text. So what I have actually, I have a comments from the uh, people who come to our hotel. I want to know that which of these customers are happy or not happy about our product. I want to use a service named Cognitive Services in uh, actually inside here that helps me to allocate the number between 0 to 1 to the comment. If the uh, comment is not really good, the number is close to 0. If the comment is really good and customer is happy about my job, it's going to pull. So I'm going to choose the service that is the score sentiment. I'm going to apply it on the yes comment. And I'm going to apply it. Firstly, what is the result? Then I will explain what happened behind the couple of seconds. So I just keep the result here and remove other column so you can. So these are the comments of the people. They said, well, I, said, I was not made aware of extra daily charge to room like me. So he's not a really happy customer. You see the number beside that is 0 0.018. This number is so close to zero. That means this customer are not happy about our product. Another one, for example, the one that is number one, the row in row number nine. Hotel was, uh, Okay, <laughs> maybe not that one. The other one, beaut the number 11, beautiful, clean, and convenient, great ocean view. So you see that actually, it's cool. yes, it's a still have some unconfidence on the data. You may see some, on, for example, number, uh, the number nine, as you see, it has good and bad things on that. So it's actually allocate a number. But what is cognitive services? What is the behind the scenes? Behind yeah, this thing is a website named Cognitive Services that one of the, one of the services of the Microsoft Azure. It's about some previous tools that you do not write any code. So AI is not actually consume the service from here. Let's look at um, some of them. For example, the language. This is a text analytics that we see in our BI. I'm going to test it here. Let's the weather. Is nice in Turkey. Okay, and going to analyze that. So the sentence is 92 percent positive. That means that I, is a nice sentence. So I'm going to make it a bit, for example, a bit warm. So you see that is actually the sentence because warm is has a kind of a negative impact on the sentence. So. It's actually 
actually gives you a sentiment analysis about what happens here. And also it gives you what is the main point of the sentence that is talking about weather and so behind the scene is that it's not just limited to that. We have, if you look at the Power BI desktop, sorry, in, yeah, inside, we have another service that is image tag. Hi, Let's look at first on the what we have here. I'm going to the vision. I'm going to the computer vision. And under that, I have sense and activity recognition. I click on the demo and I'm going to bring a data set that I have here. And just give me a second and find the data set. It actually is Reza and some of my friends. We are playing tennis together in Oakland. And as you see, able to detect the people, is able to detect in the picture, there is a person with 99% confidence. It is outdoor. There is a rocket tennis with 94 actually and other things like tennis ball and some other different things and also it's provide a sentence Reza is all explaining tennis with the actually exposing for camera so he's able to extract the uh, uh, kind of the object in the uh, actual image so you can use it so for example you have a database of the image and you can use it in color to extract what's happening in there Picture. Any question about this? Yes. These are all uh, premium capacities, is that, no? Yes, it is a premium. So the good thing about premium is that uh, these uh, cognitive services, these at least these four services, has been embedded there. So you do not need to pay an extra cost to cognitive services to do that. And also. Uh, if you want to use the free version, you need to add some code in Power Query to call these services. But here, I'm just bring my data and apply it. So this is one of the services. This is using the cognitive services. I'm going to show you another service that we have here that is about doing machine learning inside this without writing any code using the service name automated machine learning. This is a new feature again that we have here. Before that, let me um, explanation that what is about. This is a traditional example. It's an easy example to explain, so I'm always using that. That's a, about disaster that we have for Titanic. So in the Titanic, what's happened? Uh, we have uh, some people survive, some not. We start to help people to survive based on their age, gender, and passenger class. So for example, a female with a, with a child and also in a passenger class one, that is business class, has more chance to survive than the other. So even if you have a data set like that, and you want to know that if people survive or not in that disaster. Again, I have the data set stored in the blob storage, in the Titanic data set. I'm going to copy that. And I'm going back to the here, go to the data flow, <coughs> create a data flow from here. And I'm going to connect again to the block storage to data flow. Add new entity, the same process for the connection. And again, I'm using the text and CSV. Put the URL here. So this is the data it has included, like people survive or not, the passenger class, the passenger ID name, and many, many different information, as you can see. So these are the information that we have. I don't change anything. I just put a name for my data. I put the Titanic. And I just save and close the data. So I'm prepare my data and get my data. And now I'm going to apply machine learning. Yes. This feature is preview and premium. So double T. Uh, preview means that they are working on that. So 
I don't if I want to use it for production yet because for me happens because we are in Seattle, we are in New Zealand, and there's a time difference. I'll start working with that and, and I see that some engineering are working on that. So I don't recommend to use it for that production yet, but we can explore it. It has really interesting uh, features. So I can eat. Again, I save my data flow here. It's going to refresh my data set. So I ask to refresh the data set. Refresh it now. And after the data becomes clear, uh, become actually available, you will see that. It has a small brain sign here. So what is that actually? If you click on that, you see we have able to add a machine learning model to here. Click on that. And here I need to select the data. I need to set what column I'm going to predict. I'm going to predict people survive or not. I'm going to choose the survive. Going to the next step, that is about choose the model. Actually, it's a bit soon. It's Ask me about the model. So here, based on the data that I have, it says we need to use binary prediction. Binary prediction, what is that? This for situation, you are going to predict a two situation, survive or not, customer stay with us or not. So any two situation becomes either as a binary. But if you are not happy about that, you can choose a different model. So these are the models that are now available there. They are based on the automated machine learning. We have binary classification, we have general classification, regression algorithm that is used for predicting the sales and some numeric variable. And the time series one that is not working so early now. Are, if you hover your mouse, it's coming soon, so you are working on that. I'm going to choose the general classification one. Going to the next step. It asks me about which column in the data set I should choose for title. So as you see, first passenger ID, of course, we know is not in fact low correlation fine. Is able to find some correlation between passenger class, gender, and age of people. And fair and embark, which are actually is not that much relevant, but the description is really kind of a good one. So you see that which one has much more importance. Going to the next step, you should provide a name for that. So I put again the name, and you're able to choose. So it's going to train the model. It's going to get your data to get a machine learning for you. Based on how much time you want to spend to training the model, is going to apply different algorithms. So I'm just put it something really fast. Also, able doing so just a few minutes, and I can see some overview of the data. Save and close. It's going to create. A model for me, maybe it's take a time, it's just going to be refreshed. Finally, if it's done, because this may take time, I'm going to show you the result here. So after it's finished, it's actually give you a performance review. So you can look at the performance review, you just have it done. You can see some performance review like. Sometimes it is funny. Let me refresh that one. It's going to show you. So after it's finished and already done that, so if one machine <coughs> machine learning model will be create here, and <coughs> you should see the report of the machine learning model here. So this is the report that we have. 
for evaluation of his calm and not impact the internet connection. Sometimes it is slow. So that's why you see I didn't want any call. Everything was collect, select, select, and it's done. So what is that? What is the service behind of this one? I will also talk about that. You can see. Yeah, it's fine. Huh? So here we actually send about we have about one seven hundred rows of the data. We send about five hundred rows of the data to training the model. And you can see some performance that, for example, uh, you see that uh, in the scenario that people survive as a number one and not survive as number zero. So you can see that how many of them has been incorrectly prediction happened. Also, you can see some accuracy reports like precision recall and you see some that, for example, for people become sur not survive, for example, and the second stage of people who are passengers last month and three and the eight. So you can see the top influencer of that. But it's really nice report that actually showed up. If you see the report, if you're happy about the report, you can apply it on the new data set. So it's going to apply on the new data set and you can easily see the so for example, I already apply on that, so I'm going to open my Power BI desktop and And I'm going to bring the prediction into my Power BI desktop. So here, I can connect to data flow from here, our VI data flow. And here is the example of that that I've already done and apply the model. And you can easily see the result. So you see that is actually you can see the result. I just load the data. You see that. So you see that there is no no coding happen here. All of the process have been done by just some interface. So what is the behind the scene? I will talk about that. You just see the result here. The uh, people survive or not? These are the tags for people survive or not? It has true and false. Uh, you can see the probability of surviving or not. And also you can see some more explanation about that. So for example, if the gender is home of impact, if the passenger <coughs> class is one or two, all these things. So what is the behind the scene? The same as the cognitive, the same as the AI inside, we have data flow, we have cognitive services. There is another service in Azure named automated machine. Yeah. Again, this is a new tool. What happening here? Yeah. In this tool, is going, for example, uh, if I show you one of them that I have, it's going to apply at least 10 different algorithms on your data. Try different parameters on your model. So that's why you see that it sometimes takes or take about two hours or three hours to run the model because it's going to run different. For example, for the same Titanic problem, all of these dots are different variations of the algorithm with different parameters. So it's a plan, see the accuracy, and choose the best one that fits for our model. So in this example, this one, or you can see here, uh, this model has the highest accuracy here. So just let me. So you see that 80% here is actually has the highest accuracy model. So behind the scene, we have these services. So you can use it yourself. You don't, if you don't have the power of your team, you can actually use this one, but you need to know how to code and how to embed this code there. So uh, these are the really interesting 
features that you have in Power BI Premium. Uh, to be honest, it's really good because you need to pay for this one if you want to use it yourself. Uh, and also uh, embedding that in the Power BI desktop, you need to know Power Query and other, and sometimes become a bit challenging. But this feature, you can easily kind of use these services. So uh, this is that how actually this kind of combination can make life easier. Any question about that before we, I'm going to the new feature we have? Yes. And for example, you, uh, you create this uh, report and you share with me, but I don't have a payment account. You can see that. Uh, no. So you couldn't create the model. You can share. So for example, you can apply AI inside for cognitive services, but you can share. Okay, so this is the one. This is another one that I unfortunately because uh, they didn't available. Not it was available, but no, it's not. Is that you create a model in Azure Machine Learning Studio and services, and then you can see there. This is also available. Unfortunately, I couldn't demo on that. I'm going to the last part that is about the visual main influencer. How many of you work with key influencer? Yeah, cool. So what I'm going to do actually uh, is, is a visual that use lots of AI algorithm behind the scene. And back to the visual. This is a visual that I'm typing. So if you have the latest Power BI, you should see. Otherwise, you need to go to the buy option and option and setting here. And then uh, it used to be preview feature about uh, two months or one month ago, but not. So you need to come here and choose it if you couldn't. I'm going to bring a data that I have. Uh, I have a data set about uh, customer feedback i'm going to bring that one uh, or host price let's let's go for the house price oh yeah i have also the customer feedback is yeah, excel bring that one get data from excel and this data so this is about the uh, about the, the CSV file. So this data set is about the customer feedback. Customer rate me as high and low. I want to know that which attribute impact that customer rate me as high and low. So I'm low the data here. And in the next step, I'm going to choose the key influencer. For the customer feedback, uh, I have a rating. I'm just click on the visual here. I want to explain the rating of the people. I want to analyze the rating of the people by some parameter, like by number of the tickets that actually raised by them, or how many months they are with us. Or for example, the company size, and also, with the uh, role in organization. So I want to see that how rating has been impacted by this feature. So give me a chart like this. So you see that at the top, I have what influence rating to be high or low. Different attributes that have impact on people rating high is the ticket. Ticket is Actually, when something happens, they raise the ticket again. So, as much as you have lower ticket, you have higher rating, which is makes sense. Okay, so you see here, this is the number of the tickets we have. This is actually increased the chance that people actually rating us is actually uh, decreased. So, you can also see the description as ticket counts decrease, the likelihood of rating is high. Increase. For example, a follow up. First of all, some explanation for your end user. Another one is how many months they are with us. Between zero to 20 months is actually you have more happy customers. If 
they roll is publisher, again, you have more happy customer. And also, if the cost, uh, company size is between 5,000 to 50,000, again, you have a much more happy customer. So you can analyze it between high and low. And uh, the attribute you see here doesn't impact it by here. These are the algorithms behind the scene that find which attribute has more impact on rating. And it gives you some rules regarding that. I can kind of go to the top segment, check the cluster there. For example, for the first cluster, also I can see the number of people. This is a really interesting. So this visual is lots of machine learning, recursion, and decision tree behind the scene, but you couldn't see that. But you can use it for analyzing the data. Also, you can analyze it uh, for the uh, continuous variable. For example, sales class. If, well, for the house sales class, it's not in tight on the sales class if it's too big or increased. This visual also is created in February. So, in February, it is created and uh, is now kind of stable. So, you can use it for the production in your. So uh, I will share the data set, but if you want the step by step of this process, these are all blog posts and video as I write about all of these features. Uh, they are all in uh, Rabbit Hub or in our YouTube channel. And yeah, so I will write about new things. Come, so just follow on the website. We I'll try to keep you updated about this meeting. If you have any questions, this is my email and also Twitter, and if you want, if you see any problem, please let me know. Uh, I can be in touch with the Microsoft team, so your feedback is really actually uh, good for us to help them. And this is all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. Now, uh, Let's say in Turkish. Ee, şimdi e, birazcık da ben kısa bir e, session yapacağım. Yapacağım şey aslında birazcık Power Bay'in roadmap'inden, e, yakın zamanda gelecek özelliklerinden bahsetmek istiyorum. Ee, daha da gidiyor sanıyorum. Evet gidiyor. Ee, özellikle benim için yani roadmap'e baktığımda beni heyecanlandıran önemli gördüğüm özellikleri sizlerle de paylaşacağım. Sonrasında da bir soru cevap sessionıyla günü bitirmeye çalışacağız. Evet. Roadmap feature'larına geçmeden önce aslında birazcık hem şimdiye kadar konuştuklarımızı çok kısaca özetlemek istiyorum. Özetledikten sonra da o feature'ların aslında Microsoft'un yeni özellik çıkartırken hangi misyonla ya da vizyonla nereye gitmeye çalışıyor birazcık onu vermeye çalışacağım. O mesajı vermeye çalışacağım. Sonrasında da zaten free formatta sizinle konuşabiliriz. Görüşlerinizi paylaşırsanız o anlamda ilerleriz. Aslında ben bu e, slaytta şeyi özetlemeye çalıştım. BI altyapısı, klasik olarak iş zekası nereden başladı ya da ilk temel bileşenleri neler? Sonrasında yavaş yavaş biz neleri eklemeye çalışıyoruz? Görselleştirme birinci adım. Gerçekten tabii ki verinin modellenmesi çok önemli ilk seçimde bahsedilen konular ama görselleştirme output'un etkisi açısından bir numaralı şey. Genelde siz de yaşıyorsunuz zaten. Sonuç güzelse Genelde hesap sıkıntılarına kimse bakmıyor. Çok güzel bir şeymiş diyor, onu düzeltiriz diyor. Öyle bir yaklaşım oluyor. Dolayısıyla görselleştirme birinci adım. Datayı zenginleştirmek, modeli düzeltmek bunlar yine olmazsa olmazlar. Sonrasında sürecin kusursuz bir şekilde akmaya devam etmesi lazım. İnsan bağımlılığının gittikçe azalması gerekiyor. Yani insan bağımlılığından kastım bir kişi o anda orada olmadığı için rapor güncellenmiyorsa ya da bir hata ortaya çıkıyorsa bunu bir şekilde otomatik bir formata sokmamız gerekiyor. Bu da yine önemli şeylerden birisi, olmazsa olmazlardan birisi. Bir diğer konuda erişimin gerçekten her yerden yapılabilir bir şekilde kolay olması. Karar vericiler sonuçta iş zekasının amacı ne? O dataya bakarak bir aksiyona geçmek. Bu bağlamda da karar vericinin mobilden, tabletten erişimi. Bilgisayardan erişim konusunda da gerçekten 
veriye erişim de burada önemli. Sadece bir cihazla erişimin kolay olmasından bahsetmiyoruz. Oradaki UX yani e, o kullanıcı deneyimi de çok önemli. Eğer o ekrana zor ulaşıyorsa yine aslında anlamsız bir analiz. Çünkü o ekrana ulaşmakta zorlanırken belki vazgeçecek ya da kullanmayacak o insightlar ders hale gelecek. Şimdi bu maddelerin üzerine artık neyi eklemeye başlıyoruz? Biz AI'yi eklemeye başlıyoruz. Artık diyoruz ki işin içine mevcut datayı göstermenin ötesinde biraz machine learning katalım, AI katalım. Ee, Leyla'nın bahsettiği özellikleri katalım. Ee, daha da zengin bir hale gelsin. Bahsedeceğim bir diğer konu da şu. E, i̇ş zekası tool'larının genel olarak amacı ne? BI tool'larının e, bir karara varmak. Karar destek sistemi diye hatta Türkçe'ye çevriliyor. Bu karara varma kısmında karar verici o rapora bakıyor ve bir aksiyona geçiyor. Ne yapıyor? Outlook'un açıyor, bir mail atıyor. Kişiyi arıyor, şunu yapar mısın diyor, düzeltir misin diyor. Bu aksiyonları da şimdi yavaş yavaş artık otomatize hale getirmeye başlıyoruz. Yani Power BI'dan hiç çıkmadan kişi aksiyonu neyse onu yapabilsin. Bir kişiyi mentionlayıp şu an koment gönderebiliyorsunuz mesela şuna bakar mısın diye. Ama bir sipariş girmeyi Power BI'dan yapabilir miyiz? Ya da bir konuyla ilgili bir şey var CRM'de hemen bu müşteriyle ilgili bir ticket açalım operasyonunu. Power BI aşağı indirmeden yapabilir miyiz dediğimizde artık bunları da yapmaya başlıyoruz. Yani kişi rapora bakarken raporun içinde bir butona basıp hemen o müşteriyle ilgili CRM'de bir kayıt oluşturabiliyor ve rapordan hiç çıkmadan. Bu taraflara tabii bugün girmeyeceğiz ama özellikle bu bahsettiğim entegrasyonlar Power Apps'in de yardımıyla yapılıyor. E, ayrı bir session'da Power Apps'i de birazcık daha detaylı zaten paylaşmayı düşünüyoruz. Ve bunu sağladıktan sonra da aslında bu bir loop. Siz bir yandan artık veri girişi yapmaya başlıyorsunuz. CRM'e data giriyorsunuz. O data akışı ile birlikte datalarınız güncelleniyor. Bu loop'un da kusursuz bir şekilde dönmeye başlamasını sağlamaya çalışıyoruz. Peki şu sağdaki disket ne diye soracak olursanız. E, orada da aslında o disket neyi gösteriyor? Microsoft'un e, Excel ile ilgili ilk çıkarttığı reklam filmi. Şimdi birazdan göstereceğim. Bir dakikalık bir video. Excel'i biliyorsunuz Microsoft'un en başarılı ürünü. Genelde de tartışmasız e, öyle görülüyor. Hani herkesin hayatında olan. Power BI'de birazcık Excel'in rakibi. Yani ona göz dikiyor, onun kullanıcılarına göz dikiyor, e, devşirmeye çalışıyor. Şimdi Excel'in başarısı incelendiğinde en büyük başarısının mese herkese ulaşmak olduğu söyleniyor. Yani Excel'i herkes kullanabiliyor. Kimisi basit kullanıyor, kimisi advanced kullanıyor ama herkes kullanabiliyor. Microsoft'un şu anda yapmaya çalıştığı şey bu BI tool'larını, AI'yı, machine learning'i herkese kullandırtmak. Biraz önceki seçimde bahsedilen hani kod yazmadan kullanmalar da aslında buraya doğru gidiyor. Ve amaçlanan şey şey değil, hani herkes kod yazmadan e, ML yapsın ya da AI yapsın, her şey buraya bağlı hale gelsin değil. Siz orada denemeye başlıyorsunuz, sonra arkasını merak ediyorsunuz, birazcık daha koda giriyorsunuz, Excel'de düşünün. Başlangıçta bir basit bir şekilde bir şeyler yapıyorsunuz, sonra gittikçe fonksiyonları zenginleştiriyorsunuz, kendi fonksiyonlarınızı yazıyorsunuz, iş gelişiyor. E, şimdi Excel'in videosunu göstereyim, reklamını oradan konuşalım. The first name of Excel. <laughs> uh, maybe in English, it shows us the now the expression of Power Apps AI features, OTML features. Microsoft is trying to make all these tools available like Excel. What I mentioned is that. <gülüyor> ee, Okey. Şimdi bu özellikleri, daha doğrusu bu videoyu neden gösterdim? Bahsettiğimiz özelliklerin hepsi aslında bu amaçla. Yani herkes yapabilsin diye genişletilmeye çalışılıyor. Bunu gösteren birkaç road, roadmap'deki özellikten bahsedeceğim. Şimdi neler var e, yakın vadede görünen. E, bu özelliklerden birincisi Q&A feature'ı. E, eminim Q&A'yı duymayan var mı aranızda? Q&A nedir? Çok yok galiba. Q&A Power BI'nin soru cevap vasıtasıyla sorular sorup cevap alabildiğiniz özellik. Aslında şu 
E, şuradaki kısma zoom yaparsam göreceksiniz. E, temel olarak siz bir takım sorular yazıyorsunuz. Bağlaçlar vesaire yanlış olabilir. Power BI bunu anlamlandırmaya çalışıyor ve cevap veriyor. Bu özellik özellikle Türkçe desteği sebebiyle başlangıçta çok kullanılmıyordu. Yurt dışındaki e, şeyi, hype'ı çok daha yüksek şu anda. Kullanım oranları da çok daha yüksek. Türkiye'de de yavaş yavaş kullanan kurumlar başladı. Sebebi de şu, siz aslında bağlaçlar dışındaki bütün yapıyı Türkçe kurgulayabiliyorsunuz. Dolayısıyla Türkçe siz oraya ciro, bölge, işte e, satışçı bazında yazdığınızda o cümleyi anlamlandırıp size anlamlı bir şekilde sonuçlar gösterebilir hale geldi. E, bununla ilgili göstereceğimiz olarak aslında Q&A'nin kendisi değil, The Feedback Loop in Q&A. E, yani şundan bahsediyorum. Şimdi Q&A'ya e, sizin rapor son kullanıcılarınız bir takım sorular soruyor. Geliyor, diyor ki ciro... İşte kırmızı renk Akdeniz diyor. Bu cümlelerin bazılarını Power BI anlamıyor. Ama sizin de haberiniz olmuyor. Kişi size söylemesi lazım ki ben bunu söyledim çalışmadı. Siz düzeltesiniz modelinizde değişiklikler yapasınız. Şimdi artık Feedback Loop diye bir feature geliyor. Çok yakın zamanda Oktober'da yayınlanacak. Bununla birlikte şunu yapabileceksiniz. Power BI Desktop'ta sizin e, raporunuza insanlar soru olarak ne sormuş bunları göreceksiniz. Ve bu sorulan sorulardan Power BI'nin anlamadığı, bakın şurada altını kırmızı çizdiği şeyler, Power BI'nin anlamadığı şeyler. Onları size soracak bu ne demek diye. Siz diyeceksiniz ki kişi indiği dediyse işte bu benim şu kategorime tekabül ediyordur. Ya da şu ve şuyu sormaya çalışıyordur. Siz bunları gösterdikçe mesela bu örnekte ne yapıyor? Diyor ki Avsum Publisher. What is the meaning of Avsum Publisher? Ee, biz burada ne diyoruz? Sentiment is işte 0.5'ten küçük büyükse... Evsum'dır. Biz bunu tanıttığımız anda artık Q&A onu da anlamaya başlıyor. Yani birazcık daha gelişen, yapay zeka bizim de bir şeyler kattığımız bir noktaya doğru gidiyor. Ve bir diğer gelişme de şu, Q&A ile biz sorular soruyorduk ama rapordan biraz bağımsız kalıyordu. Artık raporun içine bir Q&A görseli koyabileceğiz. Diğer görsellerle entegre. Ve kullanıcı burada soru yazdıktan sonra interaktif bir şekilde buradan filtrelemeler yapıp raporla etkileşimini görebilecek. Bu da... Ayrı kapılar açacak bize görselleştirme anlamında, rapordaki eksik noktaları çözme anlamında. Number two. E, bu feature da e, son derece farklı geldi bana ilk gördüğümde. Artık son kullanıcılar e, dinamik olarak rapora bakarken ya bu eksene şunu koysak ne olur diye kendisi yapabilecek. Rapor düzenleme hakkı vermiyoruz. Sadece o görselde aksis değiştirme, görsel tipini değiştirme hakkı veriyoruz. Bu da e, son kullanıcılarda bu tür sorunları çözmek için şey yapıyorduk biz. Butonlarla, bookmarklarla farklı farklı versiyonlar yapıp onun arasında geçişler yapıyorduk. Artık kendin yap diyeceğiz yine. Yani böyle bir seçeneğim var. Modify this user deyip görseli düzenleyebilirsin diyeceğiz. E, bir diğer konuda videoda gösterdiğimin yeni bir göstergesi. Biraz önceki Excel reklamında. Artık üst ribon tamamen Excel gibi, PowerPoint gibi bir hale doğru dönüşüyor. Ee, bu da e, December'dan itibaren böyle olacak. Font değişikliği, e, renk değişikliği vesaire şeyleri artık tıpkı PowerPoint'te ya da Excel'de olduğu gibi yapmaya başlayacağız. Bu da son kullanıcıların zorlandığı şeyleri birazcık daha çözer diye düşünüyorum. Bilmiyorum hoşunuza gitti mi? Yani font değiştirme falan genelde sıkıntılı konular. Hani gir orada bul vesaire çok daha pratik görünüyor. Bir diğer konu, bunu görmüşsünüzdür belki, obje gruplandırma. Bu da çok istenen bir konuydu. PowerPoint'te ben bunları gruplandırıp taşıyabiliyorum, büyütebiliyorum, sürükleyebiliyorum. Artık Power BI'da da yapıyoruz. Bu yakın zamanda duyuruldu. Zaten yapabiliyoruz. Bu ay duru, duyuruldu. Ee, i̇leride daha güzel şeyler de görmeye başlayacağız. Mesela şu gördüğünüz konteynere bir scroll bar ekleyelim. Ve sadece oradaki görseller aşağı doğru kayabilsin. Beş görsellik bir yapıyı bir konteynera çevirip onun içinde scroll var ekleyebileceğiz. Böylece daha farklı yapılar ya da şunu yapabileceğiz. Burada şu an iki görsel var. Yukarıdaki buton bir görseli gizlediğinde diğer görsel otomatik olarak büyüyüp onun yerini dolduracak. Bu da mesela böyle interaktif şeyler yapmak istediğinizde şu anda yapamadığımız şeyler. Çok yakın zamanda onu da göreceğiz. Bu konteynerin içinde e, görsellerin size'ını dinamik olarak vereceğiz. Bir üstteki görselin tavanından işte şu kadar mesafe. Bunları da yine Genelde hiç formül yazmadan yapar hale geleceğiz. Bu arada görselde e, bu özellikleri şu an sırayla gösteriyorum. Sonra bir oylama yapacağım. Favoriniz ne diye. O bağlamda belki hızlı geçerim sonda. Yine 
oylamayı yaparız. Bir diğer feature Flow'la ilgili. E, Flow'u kullananlarınız var mı? Bilenleriniz diye sorsam, sadece duydum diyenler yine bir miktar var. Flow da Microsoft'un e, Power Platform'un bir ailesi iş akışları oluşturmanızı, farklı sistemleri birbirinize bağlamanızı sağlıyor. Tem olarak diyorsunuz ki mesela şu sıklıkla yap bunu, git Power BI'den data al, sonra her bir işte data için mail at. Power BI örneğini boş verelim, şey diyebiliyorsunuz, Twitter'da kurumunla ilgili atılan her tweet için git, e, şu kişiye bir mail at. Maile evet cevabı gelirse SharePoint'e şu dosyayı yaz. Gelmediyse sen de bir tane tweet at. İşte sonra git Gmail'imden şu datayı oku. İstediğiniz bütün tool'ları birbirine bağlayabiliyorsunuz kod yazmadan. Şimdi Flow'u anlatmaya gerek yok ama Flow'la Power BI'nin entegrasyonu bir adım daha ilerliyor. Bu da eskiden Power BI'la Flow sadece şu şekilde entegre oluyordu. Power BI'de bir data alert oluşturduğunuzda threshold değeri geçtiğinde atıyorum satış rakamı %80'in üstüne, hedefin %80'in üstüne geçtiğinde kişiye mail at. Sadece bunu yapabiliyorduk. Sonra Flow'la birlikte biz artık şuradaki aksiyonu değiştirebiliyoruz. Yani sadece mail atma, şu, şu durumlar olduysa git şunu da kontrol et, CRM'de bir tane ticket aç gibi daha advanced şeyleri yapabiliyoruz. Şimdi yakın zamanda gelecek özellik, yine October bekleniyor bu özellikte. Şunu yapabileceğiz. Diyeceğiz ki Flow'a, arada bir sen git Power BI'ya, benim söylediğim sıklıkla, Git Power BI'ye şu sorguyu gönder. Calculate table'la. Dark sorgusu yazacağız. Ve soru var galiba. Soruyu alayım. Buradaki yeni gerçek özellikte Power BI'deki data setini Flow'la besleyebilecek miyim peki? Ee, şu an Power BI'de streaming data setleri Flow'la besleyebiliyoruz. Ee, streaming data set oluşturursanız oraya row ekle, yeni satırlar ekle, canlı olarak yapabiliyorsunuz. Bunu kullanabilirsiniz. Ee, ben burada... Data okuyorum Power BI tarafından ve diyorum ki gelen response body içindeki her bir satır için test governor'a bir tane mail at. Yani diyorum ki Power BI'den git bunun sonucunu öğren. Gelen cevaptaki her bir bayiye şu kadarlık bakiyen kaldı diye bir tane mail at. Operasyonunu artık tetikleyebiliyorum. Veya her bir kayıt için git işte CRM'de şu, şu işlemleri yap diyebiliyorum. Bu ne manaya geliyor? Artık benim Power BI'de hesapladığım bütün data bir aksiyon için trigger olabilir. Ve belli sıklıkla ben Power BI raporunda kontroller yapıp işlemler başlatabilirim anlamına geliyor. Next feature. Ee, bu da güzel bir feature. Şimdi şu anda biz neye sahibiz? Power BI'da dataset limiti. Takılanlarınız eminim vardır dataset limitlerine. Daha büyük şeylerle uğraşmak isti istiyorum diye. Şu anda Power BI'da dataset limiti Pro'da 1 GB, Premium'da 10 GB. Ama bu limitler her zaman yetmiyor. Artık veri miktarı her kurumda, yani kurumun size ufak bile olsa ciddi miktarlara ulaşmaya başlıyor. Microsoft'ta bu anlamda e, özellikle büyük müşterilerden gelen talepler sebebiyle, bunu da açık açık söylüyorlar. Yani bazı müşteriler var şey diyor işte ben e, 64 korluk premium istiyorum diyor. Microsoft diyor ki öyle bir şey yok, işte çıkartın diyorlar filan. Zorla o kadar büyük bir makine cloud'da kaynak çıkartılıyor. Hatta... Biraz önce konuştuk özellikle Unilever, P&G gibi büyük global şirketler işte 200 bin çalışanı var. 200 bin çalışanı için bir rapor yayınlamak istiyor adam. Öyle bir ortam için Microsoft'ta sürekli bu sınırları genişletmek zorunda kalıyor. Yakın zamanda şey duyuruldu artık Power BI Premium'daki limitler şuradaki 10 GB kalkacak. Kalkacak şu manaya geliyor. Siz kapasiteniz ne kadar izin veriyorsa istediğiniz kadar datayı modeli yükleyebileceksiniz. Tabii ki çok yüksek bir rakam yüklerseniz performans olarak zorlanma ihtimaliniz var. Ama bu sınırı birazcık daha size bırakacak. Sonrasında da bu birazcık daha, bu arada tarih bununla ilgili yanlış. Bu kadar yakın olmayacak bu. Ee, extended memory diye bir şey gelecek. 4 terabaytlık cloud'da çalışan in memory makinalara kadar sunulacak. Bu da farklı kapılar açacak gibi gözüküyor. Last but, but not least, ee, bu feature da benim çok hoşuma gitti. Direct Query bir raporum var, Power BI Desktop'ta yaptım. Ee, Direct Query'nin mantığı ne? Ben sürekli datayı göreyim. Ama hep bir refresh'e basmam gerekiyor. Raporu yayınladıktan sonra da aynı şey. Bir monitöre yansıttığımda, real time datanın değişimini görmek istediğimde dashboard kullanabiliyorum, maksimum 15 dakika yayınıyor. Streaming dataset kullanmam lazım. Artık şöyle bir şey yapabileceğiz. E, raporu yaptıktan sonra şuradaki refresh interval kısmından saniye seçip bu rapor bir saniyede bir artık refresh edesin diyorum. Ve daha önemlisi şurada 
Height Refresh Indicator diye bir seçenek var. O da şu manaya geliyor. Normalde bir raporu refresh ettiğinizde hani görseller bir sönüp tekrar geliyor ya. Onu da kapatıyorum. Böylece sanki streaming dataset gibi görselde e, işte bar chart var. Bar chart yükseliyor, alçalıyor. Özellikle sensör izlemelerinde vesaire güzel bir noktaya gelecek. Bunu önceden nasıl yapıyorduk? Workaround yapanlar vardır. Browser refresh ilk genelde söylenen konu. Yani browser'daki add-onlar, Chrome'a bir add-on kuruyoruz, o kendi kendine refresh yapıyor ama sayfa bir gidip geliyordu. Artık seamless bir şekilde olabilecek. Bu demoyu da ben bir yerden aldım. Bir bilgisayar oyunu oynarken anlık olarak e, arabanın konumu, işte CPU'su vesaire oyundaki data for via desktop'ta görüntüleniyor. Bir soru var galiba. Bildiğim kadarıyla Pro ve Premium'da yapabiliyoruz ya, evli bir şeyimiz var, ortamımız var. Şey, e, yok bu, bu gösterdiğim özellik premiumla ilgili değil. Pro'da da available olacak. Çok, e, bunun çıkış tarihi doğru. Evet benim göstereceğim 7 feature is and e, now if you have any question in Turkish or English we are ready to answer. We hope you enjoyed all this session. Uh, we will try to make these meetups uh, more frequently in the future. Uh, and, and at this point, I would like to also thank you to uh, the, our partner Halil. Uh, he couldn't attend this event due to the, his on the abroad, but uh, he, is, he is also really supporter of uh, our Turkish community, Power Platform and Power Apps community. Uh, if you have any question, we will be happy to answer. Uh, let's ask this question to Leila. Uh, in your uh, auto ML uh, presentation, you say uh, there, there was a binary classification. Uh, what is the difference of this uh, option from is the classification? Uh, classification? There is not, uh, uh, actually this is just for uh, uh, unsupervised learning. It doesn't have unsupervised learning that is clustering. So it's just for predictive analysis. Okay, so. Another question. Is it on your experiment, is it the, the, the key influencer to be helpful? Does it run the same uh, algorithm? So it's actually using the algorithm like decision tree and regression, so not, not related to cognitive services. This is some R and Python behind the scenes. So Power BI uh, has some visual like decision tree before. So in marketplace, you can find them, but that one is very really hard to explain to end user. So they kind of going to embed it as a visual that better explanation. But yeah, this is. So would you recommend like going forward with uh, the built in key influences uh, approach or writing R or Python approach? So if you write your own R Python, for example, I did it for some customers, it's really hard to explain to them that what for prediction, yes, but for extracting that which factor impact on the other, you need to do, you create good visualization. So this one is really good for business user to explain. What if you ask me about the accuracy? Again, we need to check. I didn't, when I check it's good, but I, I'm not sure exactly. They are going to provide some accuracy report on that soon. Another question. Uh, if I want to train a model in the AI builder, it takes extra cost from me. Uh, in Power BI, is it the same? It's already, oh, thank you, thanks so much. It's already embedded in the premium price. So if you pay, that one is already embedded. Thank you. Başka sorusu olan var mı? Sanırım yok. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for presenting. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope all of you enjoy. Teşekkürler. Katıldığınız için.